with a show of hands, have a TV show that your spouse can't stand? Or maybe your boyfriend, or maybe your girlfriend, or maybe your fiance, or maybe your parents. That type of TV show, when, when they walk in the room, they're like, are you watching this again? <laughs> right? Like, and my response, usually because my wife does this all the time to me, of course, my response is like, yeah, so what? Right? Like, I have a few of these TV shows. American Pickers, Pawn Stars, and Barter Kings. I love those three shows, and it doesn't matter how many times they're on. It doesn't matter if I turn on the television and it's a rerun and I've already seen it, I'm going to watch it. And I love it because I just love the shows, but my wife walks in and she's like, didn't you see this one already? And I'm like, so what? That just means like I'm going to be really good when he says, how much do you want for this? I'm already going to know the answer, right? Right? And I I love the History Channel because they play marathons of my favorite shows all the time. On Saturday, they'll literally play 10 hours of American Pickers or 10 hours of Pawn Stars or 10 hours of Barter Kings. And my wife, she'll come in and she'll sit down. Oh, my sweet wife. And she says, honey, we've already watched three hours of this show. Can we please change the channel and me, like, I, my, like, my offhanded, witty remark usually is something like, you know, honey, we have another television, <laughs> which, which usually results in a backhand. No, 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 my wife doesn't really hit me. She really hits me. She's a tough girl, and I don't really wanna mess with her at all. She's the boss. I've only been married, so our three-year anniversary was just a couple weeks ago, so I've only been married three years, but in those three years, I have learned this. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. You want to change the channel? Yes, dear. It's no problem. But all jokes aside, my wife is out of town this week, so that means I'm a bachelor, which means, guess what? I get to watch whatever I want. So if American Pickers is on, I get to watch it. If Pawn Stars is on, I get to watch it. If Barter Kings is on, I get to watch it. So inspired by my freedom to get to watch whatever I want, at any time I want, without somebody saying, didn't you see this one already? I titled my message tonight, Barter Kings. Barter Kings, one of my favorite shows. And it could be Barter Kings or Barter Queens, right? Because we're all joint heirs with Christ, so we're all kings and queens, right? But I just wanted to say Barter Kings because it went with the TV show, you know, so that is what it is. So, if you just bow your head for a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I praise you, I worship you, Lord God. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that it would be you that speaks through me, Lord God, that it wouldn't be I that speaks, Lord God, but you would pierce the hearts of each and every individual in this room, Lord God. Lord God, let us bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you wanna open up your Bibles to Mark chapter three, verses 13 and 14. Mark chapter three, verses 13 and 14. Now I'm gonna be bouncing all over the Bible, but we're gonna start in Mark chapter three, verses 13 and 14. Give me an amen when you're there. Amen. All right, Mark chapter three, verses 13 and 14 say this. Afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountain and he called out the ones he wanted to go with him and they came to him. Then he anointed, or he appointed the 12 of them And he called them apostles, and they were to accompany him, and they were sent out to preach. You see, I believe God is stirring up this church. I believe that God is moving in this church, and that God wants to use each and every single one of you to go out and to preach the gospel. I believe that you're here tonight because God wants to use you. God wants to use your life to help transform your family's lives, to help transform your coworkers' lives, to help transform any person that you run in, your path runs into. God wants to use your life. Can I get an amen? Whatever the audience is that God places you in front of, God wants to use you to help transform that life for the glory of God. And I believe that each one of us has a calling. Jesus called the 12 up there, but he could have called each and every one of us up there. The purpose of my message tonight is this. I would argue that every single character we look up, and look up to in the Bible, at some point in their life, struggled with their faith. 
At some point in their life, they had a down season. Every man and woman in this Bible that I look up to, I know that everything wasn't great. So tonight I wanna talk to you guys about a few reasons why we struggle with our faith. Now this of course is not gonna be an exhaustive study because that could be weeks worth of studies. But this is just, as I've been doing my devotionals and as I've been getting alone with God, this is really what he's been laying on my heart. A few reasons why we struggle with our faith. And reason number one is because we fail to understand that we are called to lead. We struggle with our faith because we fail to understand that we are called to lead. We are called to be leaders. If you know me at all, or if you've been here on a Wednesday night and you've heard my messages, you probably understand that I love leadership. I love studying leadership, and I think that it's important. My master's is in leadership. In January, I'm gonna be starting a PhD in leadership. I love leadership, and the reason I love leadership is because we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the ultimate leader. He's the the servant leader. And if we're made in the image of God, and Jesus Christ led people, shouldn't we? You know, we often think about Jesus Christ only leading the 12, but in reality, there was hundreds and sometimes thousands of people following Jesus. And we are called to lead. We are called to lead. I said this before and I'll say it again. Each and every single person in here is a leader. Each and every single person in here is leading somebody towards Christ or away from Christ. Each and every person in here is a leader in some respects. Maybe it may be a position. Maybe you're actually a leader of a small group. But regardless of whether you you have a position of leadership or not, each and every single person has a sphere of influence. You see, Jesus Christ didn't lead people by being a manager. He didn't lead people by having a position of authority. He didn't come down and say, well, I'm the son of God. You need to listen to me and follow me. You know how he led people? Influence. Leadership is simply influence, and each and every one of us have a sphere of influence. We have people in our lives that we are influencing one way or the other, people at our jobs, people in our family, people that we hang around, our friends. So we are either leading them towards the Lord or away from the Lord. And in that verse we just read in Mark chapter three, Jesus went up on the mountain and he called those he wanted. And I believe that each and every one of us have heard that calling. That moment when Jesus reached down to us. Maybe it was when you were in the darkest place of your life like I was. When I was a drug addict, when I was an alcoholic, when I was caught up in lust, when I was 10 feet in the grave. Maybe it was when you were a little kid. Maybe it was when you were at kids camp. Maybe it was when you were a youth or a youth camp. Maybe it was when you were a young adult at a young adult's retreat. Maybe it was three years ago. Maybe it was 30 years ago. But I believe each of us have heard that calling from the Lord. And when he called you, he called you to be a leader. He called you to accompany him. He called you to go out and preach. Now, does that mean that each and every one of us is called to be a pastor? Probably not, right? But I do believe that each and every one of us is called to be a minister. We're all called to minister to people wherever God has placed us. Our missions field is our job. Some people will stand in a pulpit Some people will stand in a factory line. But each and every one of us are called to be a minister. We're called to be a light in a dark place. When you have a light, you don't put a basket on it, right? You put it on a lampstand so it will light the whole room. And when light goes into a room, darkness doesn't just stick around for a little bit. Darkness flees. And we are called to do that. How many here know what a tandem bike is? Is everyone pretty familiar with what a tandem bike is? A tandem bike is a two-person bike where one person sits on the front and steers and one person sits on the back and there's a set of handlebars and there's two sets of pedals. But how many of you guys know that if you're in the back seat of the tandem bike, although there may be handlebars there, you don't have any decision on where you're going. Those handlebars are simply there for you to just hold on to. 
right? And if you want to, you could just sit back, lift your feet off the pedals, and you could just go along for the ride. Because the person in the front seat will keep pedaling and they'll keep steering. And too many of us believe our position in Christ is to just go along for the ride. I'll say it again. Too many of us believe that our position in Christ is just to go along for the ride. Are we to let God lead us? Of course. But we're not just going along for the ride. When you accept Jesus into your life, you don't just hit cruise control and say, I'm just gonna make it to the end. It's not the way it works. In Deuteronomy 28, 13, it says this. If you listen to my commands that I am giving you today and you carefully obey them, I will make you the head and not the tail. If you listen to my commands and you obey them, I will make you the head and not the tail. What he's saying here is that you're supposed to be in the front seat of the tandem bike, not in the back. You're called to lead and not to follow what the world tells you to do. When God saved you, he called you to lead. And don't be afraid to lead because as a leader, you're working under the authority of God. I think we all would understand this concept, right? Because each one of us at some point have worked at a job where we've had a manager. And that manager led you, but most managers have a manager above them. They're working under authority. So when we're called to lead, we are leading under the authority, under the umbrella of God. But we have to understand this. Their effectiveness as a leader is determined by a relationship with God. Our effectiveness as a leader is gonna be determined by our strength and our relationship with God. How close are you with God? And I'll tell you how good of a leader you're gonna be. You can't lead somebody if you're not being led by the Lord because you're not gonna lead them in the direction that they need to go. So the first reason I believe people struggle in their faith is because they fail to understand that we are called to be leaders. And the second reason is this. We don't accept the fact that each one of us has a calling. Each one of us has a calling. When, God is, when God's calling is more than just getting his people out of sin. You understand what I'm saying? When God saved you, he didn't save you just to, get, to give you a get out of jail free card. Each of us has a calling. Each of us has a passion. Each of us has a desire that God has placed inside of our hearts. And I believe that people struggle in their faith because they fail to follow their calling. They fail to follow the calling that God has placed in their hearts. And our calling is where our passions that God has placed in our heart and the open doors that God places in front of us intersect. And then we step out of the boat. That can be one of the hardest things, right? Every one of us has passions. Every one of us has desires. Every one of us has something that just burns in our heart that if we could do anything, that's what we would do. And God places those desires in our hearts. But we have to be willing to step out of the boat. And sometimes we don't even know the steps that God wants us to take. He just says, William, take a step. You just have to be willing to take that one step. You see, I, was, I feel like I'm called to ministry but if I never went to Bible college, if I never got my credentials, if I never studied, if I never did the things that I was supposed to do, I wouldn't be standing here today. Pastor called on me and said, hey, can you preach tonight? If I wouldn't have studied, if I wouldn't have came up with a message, I would have just been standing up here in front of you guys really embarrassed. <laughs> and my good looks will only get me so far. You see, we have a part to play in it. God has a calling on each and every one of your lives, but we have a part to play in that calling. You know, when my wife says, honey, can you please change the channel? I could say, we got another TV, or I could say, yes. What's the wise decision? Right? I don't like to sleep on the couch. I don't know about you. But what I've recognized is this, that just because we know that we have a calling, that's not enough. Just because we all understand that God has a calling in our lives, that's not enough. We have to accept that calling, right? In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. That's a, that's a painful statement. Many are called, but few are chosen. 
In Matthew chapter 22, we find a parable, the parable of the wedding feast. And many of you guys probably know this parable, so I'm not gonna read it. I'm just gonna, just gonna go over the, some of the main points. The king is having a wedding feast, right? And the king says, hey, servants, go on and invite all of these people that I'm inviting to this wedding. And when the servants go out and they bring the invitation to the door, the people who are getting the invitations ignore the invitation. They, they make up excuses why they can't go. And in fact, when the person goes to drop off the invitation, they even kill some of the people. Imagine that job, right? Hey, uh, can you go drop off this invitation? You knock on the door. Hey, I got this invitation from the king, and then they just kill you. The next round, those people probably aren't so willing to say, hey, I'll drop off these invitations. But of course, they're talking about Israel and the Jewish people because God sent prophets to tell the Israelites of the, of the, of the king, of God. And then they sent Jesus. And of course, they killed Jesus. But then the story goes on, the king says, you know what, I want you to go out to the street corners. I want you to go out and get the people that wouldn't normally be invited to this party, like me, like maybe some of you, you fill in the blank. My past doesn't get me to the king's festival. My past doesn't get me to the banquet table. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that. And all those people come. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. So that begs the question of this. How do I get chosen? How do you get chosen? The answer is simple. You answer the call. When the invitation comes, you say, yes, I will go. You are SVP. Think about this. If you place myself on a basketball court, and you place Michael Jordan on a basketball court, arguably the best basketball player ever, depending on who you ask, of course. And you give each of us the ball. Now, don't let this height fool you. I'm no basketball player. I'll shoot, and I will miss the backboard. Somehow, I can be three feet in front of the hoop, and I can throw it up, and it'll go, like, right over. It's not my sport. But if you give each of us the ball, and I shoot the ball, and Jordan holds on to the ball, Guess who has a better chance of making the shot? I do, right? Like 100% chance of making the shot more than somebody that's holding on to the ball. Because 100% of the time, you're gonna miss the shot if you don't accept the invitation. You understand what I'm saying here? Now I'm gonna say this slow because I really want you to get this part. Whenever we say no to God's calling, it's an issue that surrounds an appetite. Whenever we say no to God's calling, it's an issue that surrounds an appetite. An appetite only has a one word vocabulary, more. What you're really saying when you're saying no to God's calling in your life, what you're saying is, I wanna do this more than what you want me to do, God. You understand what I'm saying here? It's our appetite that we're after. And if we don't wanna do what God's doing, what we're saying really is, look, God, this is more important to me than listening to you. It always surrounds an appetite. And whatever we're chasing, if we're called into ministry, relationships would be our number one thing. But instead of chasing relationships that will benefit and glorify God in your ministry, you'll chase whatever relationship will step in front of you. You'll chase whatever it is that you want more than God's calling on your life. And you know what happens? It'll never fill that hole. And you'll just keep chasing it and chasing it and chasing it. Hmm. I don't believe that having an appetite is a bad thing. I believe that God created us to have an appetite. But I believe that the devil distorted that. You understand what I'm saying? God called us to have an appetite. It's good to have passions and desires and have an appetite. And when they're focused in the right direction, you can move mountains. But when they're focused for the world, that's it. I'm gonna be completely transparent here, 100%. There's only one invitation that would kill me to refuse. And yet it's the one that I'm tempted to refuse the most often. I get an invitation every single morning 
to accept the calling that Jesus Christ has placed in my life. I get that calling every day to say, what are you gonna do today to fulfill the calling I placed in your life? And it's not easy to live for the Lord. The world kind of distorts it and say, well, it's pretty easy because you live off Jesus and he's your crutch. It's not easy to follow God. It's not easy to follow the calling that God has placed in your life because you don't always know what's gonna happen next. And I'm, a, I'm the type of person that likes to see the beginning and the end. But there's only one Alpha and Omega. But I have a choice. And you have a choice. Each of us has a choice whether we're gonna accept that calling or today I'm gonna take the day off. Have you guys seen that commercial where the dad takes the day off? Fathers don't get a day off, right? We don't get to choose. Today, I'm just not gonna do what God has called me to do. God wants 100% of us. He doesn't want 80. He doesn't want 70. He wants 100%. And refusing to say yes to God looks like numbing yourself. It looks like distracting yourself with work, with your family, with godly things. You can distract yourself with godly things and not even be following the call of God in your life. You see, many are called, but few are chosen because few choose to say yes. And the list, of course, could go on and on and on. There's so many things that could get in the way of our calling. There's so many things that can be placed in front of us that will have an appetite more for this than for the calling of God in our lives. And can you even believe that Jesus would invite people to a banquet and they wouldn't show up? Well, here's your invitation. Here's your invitation. Are you gonna say yes? Hmm? We have a choice. We get to choose whether we're gonna follow God and listen to him and follow the calling that he's placed in our lives or we can choose to say, well, not today, God. When my wife says, can we change the channel? I can choose to say yes or I can choose to say no. I choose to say yes. You know, going back to this whole idea of the three favorite shows I love, even though my wife doesn't love them, and when she comes in the room, I'll choose to say yes. When they're on, I choose to say, yes, I will watch them. And part of the reason why I love these shows so much is because I love the bartering. I love the haggling that they do in the shows. I love that they, you know, in Pawn Star, or, uh, American Pickers, they'll go into this huge barn that looks like it should just be like collapsed in on itself. There's a dust everywhere. They'll dig around through the small things and they'll find this little tiny thing. They'll be like, ooh, look at this. And the guy's like, I didn't even know I had that. And the guy, they're like, well, I'll give you $100 for it. The guy's like, oh, no, no, now that I remember I have it, I think I want $500 for it. And they'll go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, they'll say, how about we just split it in the middle for $300? I just love the bartering aspect of it. It makes me think that I'd be like a bartering ninja watching these shows. When I go to buy a car, I'm like, you know what? I think I want this car for this price, and then we'll go back and forth and negotiate. But when I get there, I'm really just a sucker, and I pay whatever they ask me to pay. <laughs> Super sad. But the third reason I believe people struggle in their faith is because they try to barter with God. They try to barter with God. When I got on a Teen Challenge, I went on a, a mission trip for three weeks with a bunch of guys from Teen Challenge, and there was a guy in our group, he would, he would have been the barter king. He bartered everything through Teen Challenge. You needed a camera? Okay, what do you got? Let's trade. And we went to Africa, and if you've ever been to a third world country or another country, you know that there's a lot of markets there and in the markets they sell a lot of knockoff things. And one day he comes up to me, and he's like, dude, check out my watch. It's a Rolex. Dude, a Rolex. Check out these diamonds. He was so excited. He's like, see that Rolex? He was like elated. I'm like, how much did you pay for that? And he's like, the guy wanted 10? I talked him down to five. He was super proud. Like, all right, good for you. But you know what? By the end of those three weeks, the diamonds were falling out of it. The hand, one hand was stuck here and one hand was like flopping around at the six o'clock somewhere. It wasn't worth anything. You know why? Because it didn't cost anything. Right? 
and I know I have, and I'm sure that you probably have, when you find yourself in a tough situation, and instead of letting that help you grow in your faith, you try to barter with God and say, God, if you take this, I'll do this. If you do this, God, I'll do that. Let's be honest. I found myself there. In Teen Challenge, I used to say, everyone's an atheist until they stand in front of a judge. And then all of a sudden, they're like, Lord, please get me out of this charge. I'll be a good husband if you get me out of this DUI. I'll be a good mother if you get me out of this case. You find yourself bartering with God. You say, well, God, I know you want 100% but let me keep my movies, or let me keep my friends, or let me keep my music, or let me keep my girlfriend, or my language, or my drinking, or my smoking, or you fill in the blank, whatever God is telling you to get rid of. And it's like God is up there saying, well, let me see here. huh? You can keep your music and your friends, but I get drinking and premarital sex, okay? Is that a deal? God doesn't border. We don't serve a God who barters. Let's get real. We're in no position to barter with God, right? No position. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we find a king, King Saul, the barter king. That's what I'm gonna call him, the barter king. King Saul, the barter king. God tells King Saul that you need to completely destroy the Amalekite nation. God tells him to kill everything. Saul kills most things. God tells him to do one thing, and he does another. And instead, he captures their king, and he spares their best sheep, and goats, and cattle, and lambs. And then it says, whatever was delightful to them, whatever looked good to them, they took. It kind of reminds me of a shopping spree, right? Oh, well, I want this, and this. Oh, this looks good, and this. I'll take this. Whatever appealed to them, they just took. (laughs) Then the Lord said, I am so sorry I ever made Saul king. Mm. How many of you guys here have had a mentor, a loved one, a parent, a grandparent, somebody you look up to, and they say, I'm not really mad, I'm just disappointed. Now imagine God doing that. You see, when we try to barter with God, he's not mad. He loves us unconditionally, but I'm sure he's thinking, I'm just a little disappointed in your actions that you think that you can barter with me, the King of King, the Lord of Lords. He loves us unconditionally. He wants what's best for us. He's the beginning and the end. He knows the whole story before we've even been placed in it. So why do we try to barter for a better story? Doesn't even make sense. You see, Saul tried to barter with God. And when we try to justify our actions, what we're actually doing is bartering with God. And when Saul found out that God was very disappointed in him, he said, well, I actually kept these animals as a burnt sacrifice to you, God. I actually did this. I disobeyed you for you. I disobeyed you for you, of course. And when that didn't work, he had to come up with another excuse. I did this because I was afraid of what the people would do. I was afraid. When God tells you to kill something, you kill it. When God tells you to kill something in your life, kill it. It's not gonna benefit you. God knows what's best for you. Don't try to barter with God. You see, we can justify anything in our head. We can justify anything. Well, God told me not to do this, or God told me to let this go, but I can use it to glorify God. God told me to kill everything, but I can use these animals as a burnt sacrifice to God. I mean, my calling in life is to glorify God and to give God sacrifice, right? But the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We can talk ourselves into making anything sound good. But when we try to start justifying things, we have to have that that little thing in our head saying, ah, this isn't right. Because all the justification we need was done on the cross. Can I get an amen? When we start justifying things, that's a red flag to us saying, hey, if I'm justifying this, I may need to take a closer look at what I'm doing. Disobedience doesn't glorify God. 
Bartering doesn't glorify God. Not following the calling that God has placed in your life doesn't glorify God. Worship team, if you guys could go ahead and come on up. Finally, I believe people struggle with their faith because of disobedience. Because of simple disobedience. I think most of us kind of understand this concept, right? It makes sense. When we're disobedient to God, we're gonna struggle in our faith. Saul failed to obey God and God stripped him of his crown. Mm. And each of us has a calling. Each of us has something that God wants to do. Each of us has the choice whether we're gonna be obedient to God's voice or disobedient to God's voice. But if we choose to be disobedient to God's voice, God will find somebody else. If God tells you to talk to this person and you decide not to, God's not gonna leave that person hanging. Well, William wouldn't talk to them, so I guess they're not getting to heaven now. God will replace you. How much does that hurt? Right? And the story of the, the banquet festival and the king. When the first invitation went out and those people said no, what did God do? He found somebody to fill the seats. When Saul refused and disobeyed God, the very next chapter, he anointed King David. If you choose to say no, God will find somebody else. Was King David perfect? Heck no. But you wanna know the difference between David and Saul? King Saul was after the kingdom of self, and King David was after the kingdom of God. David messed up, but he repented. Simple obedience isn't really all that simple, right? Because it takes death to self. It takes, taking, it takes picking up your cross and carrying it daily. Simple obedience is not always the easiest thing especially when God tells you to step out of the boat onto a stormy sea and you don't understand why you're doing it. Each and every one of us has been in that position where God says, do this, and when you do it, you don't understand why, but in retrospect, you see, oh, that's why he did that, because he loves me. He didn't want me to go down this path. He called me over here. He helped me get over an obstacle by telling me no here or telling me yes there but we have to be obedient. And later on in the story, David finds himself running and hiding in a cave because Saul is now after David and King David is now a fugitive. And Saul goes into the cave to relieve himself and David's right there. David could kill Saul and become the king that God had anointed him to become. But David says, no, I will not kill God's anointed one. David was obedient. And David's men that were with him in the cave, they didn't understand it. And sometimes you're gonna have to follow in obedience and people around you aren't gonna understand. Why did you do that? That doesn't even make sense. Why did you love that person when they hate you so much? Why did you do this or that? And they won't get it. But that's all right because God does. And sometimes you're gonna have to do something and be obedient and you're not even gonna get it yourself. And that's okay too. Because God is the lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path. And all we need to know is what is the next right step to take for God. Listen for God's voice. You're called to be the head and not the tail. You're called to lead and not to follow. God has a calling on each and every one of your guys' lives and he wants to use you. Don't try to barter with God and just be obedient when he tells you to do something. If everyone could please stand to their feet. With heads down and eyes closed, if you feel like you're here today and you're not leading in the way that God has called you to lead, would you place your hands up? I wanna pray with you. Amen.
see your guys' hands. See your hands. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you say, I know that God has a calling on my life and I want to say yes to that calling. But right now, I don't feel like I'm doing that successfully. I want to pray for you that you'll have strength to do that. Would you raise your hands? Amen. I see your guys' hands. Finally, if you find yourself bartering with God, if you find yourself saying, God, if you do this, I'll do that. You're trying to manipulate your way through your relationship with God. I want you to raise your hand. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you just say, I wanna give my 100% to God, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, God, I wanna be 100% sold out for you. Would you raise your hand? Amen. After I pray, the altars are open and I would, I would encourage you to come forward and lay out your petitions before the Lord because he hears your cries. He hears your prayers and God is faithful and just and he will listen to your prayers and he will move in your lives. If you're willing to just say, Lord, take this, take the wheel, and let me get out of the way. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we praise you. We thank you and we worship you, Lord God, for allowing to come into your presence, Lord God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Lord God. So direct our lives. Help us to become leaders, Lord God. Help us to be obedient to the calling that you placed in our lives. Lord God, give us strength when we don't have it. Lord God, give us faith when we don't have it. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart, Lord God, that beats like yours does, Lord God, that just loves on people. Lord God, help us, help us, Lord God, to not walk in willful sin, to be willfully disobedient to you, Lord God. Give us that strength, Lord God. When we are weak, Lord God, be our rock. Lord God, we praise you. Lord God, we worship you. Lord God, we lay it down to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The altars are open.